Hey, everybody. Um, for those of you who are new on campus, uh, the Institute is um, a China-focused center, partly research, partly programs in China, focused on economics with an emphasis on uh, market-based structural reforms, which we promote in China, but also some environmental programming in China. And then here at the university, we do this series once a month. So come knock on our door. It's always open. Um, and this series is the most visible thing we do on campus, but it's also one of my favorite things because we get to have all our friends come to town. And today, we have one of my best pals and favorite people to come talk, Andrew Shearer. Um, Andrew's Australian, but he's in Washington now uh, as a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is a big Washington think tank where he runs a project on American alliances in Asia. Uh, Andrew is a longtime uh, Asia Pacific hand, alliance hand, uh, strategist extraordinaire. He was the national security advisor to two Australian prime ministers, John Howard uh, and then Tony Abbott. Uh, but we first met, you were the political counselor at the Australian Embassy in Washington. I was in the State Department. So he's been working alliance issues and looking at trends and developments in the Pacific for a long time. We haven't done a lot on alliances. We had Victor Cha come out and talk a little bit about Korea, but America's alliances in Asia are really the backbone, not just of its security presence and posture, but really of Asia Pacific security, particularly since the 1960s. The United States has five bilateral alliances in Asia with Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, Thailand, and the Philippines. Um, those alliances wax and wane in different ways, particularly the alliances with Thailand and the Philippines. Um, but they are the basis for American forward deployed military presence and also because countries like Japan, Australia, and the Republic of Korea are democracies that share values with the United States, we tend to have, even though it's not a multilateral alliance, a common perspective on the region. Um, those alliances, to my mind, are more important than ever because the region is changing. And even though they started in the context of one set of threats connected to the Cold War, there is a huge amount of uncertainty now in Asia with a rising China in particular, but with other things as well, other security threats like North Korea that make those alliances and the revitalization of them very important. Uh, unlike Europe, where France and Germany fought a lot of wars, but then managed to make peace in the post-World War II period, China and Japan in particular have not had a Franco-German moment. And until they do, uh, and until other issues like the future of Korea is resolved, there's really not a basis for collective security in the Pacific, which to my mind means American presence and these alliances will continue to remain a very important feature of everybody's security, with the exception of who? China, which in a lot of ways has, um, I would argue, free ridden off some of the benefits those alliances provide, but doesn't like those alliances and is increasingly uncomfortable with them because it sees them as directed against China in some ways. Um, so we're at this moment of uncertainty, a rising China, new governments in some of these places, and the United States that's trying to come to terms with change at the same time that some of its allies are coming, trying to come to terms with change. So the questions, there are operational and tactical questions. How do you revitalize these? But there's also the strategic questions. What does the region look like to these countries, individually and potentially collectively? Do they share the same view of China, of the other threats and uncertainty in the region? And that's what people like Andrew, who've been working alliance issues for a long time, are struggling with. And I think that's a lot of what you're working on in your alliance project at CSIS. So we thought it would be fun to have Andrew here. Um, but uh, he's a great speaker and worked on a lot of this stuff for a long time. But I thought it would also be interesting to have kind of an alliance perspective on the rise of China and security issues in the region as they're evolving. So we're very cash. We'll have you talk for, I don't know, 30, 35 minutes and then do your own Q&A. We have a great audience, students, faculty, some other assorted folks uh, who wander in. Um, so we'll, please join me, welcome my old pal and friend Andrew. Andrew, sure, welcome. Thank you. Well, Evan, thank you and um, Hello everyone, it's great to see you. It's a real honor to be here at the Un University of Chicago and to be addressing the Paulson Institute. And um, I'm very grateful to my old friend Evan for, for making it possible. Um, Evan has been a 
a stalwart servant of American public policy um, for as long as I've known him, and um, I think it's probably right to say even longer than that. Uh, and the other thing about Evan that I should uh, acknowledge here today is that he's been a great, a great friend uh, and champion of the US alliance with Australia. And um, he's well known to uh, many Australians, um, many of our most senior public figures know and respect Evan greatly. So thank you very much for the chance to, to be here. Um, of course, uh, I'm speaking to you against the backdrop of uh, President Trump heading off today on his 12-day uh, tour around the Asia-Pacific region, which is the longest visit to the region by uh, an American president, I think, in about a quarter of a century. Um, so that provides the context, and of the countries that the president's visiting, uh, three of them are allies that, that Evan mentioned. Uh, he's going first to Japan, he's going to South Korea, uh, and later on he's also visiting the Philippines, and of course he's also in between those visiting China and Vietnam. So I think it's a particularly good time to be looking at uh, American strategy in, in Asia and uh, the role of the alliances in, in executing that, that strategy. Um, the alliances, when you think about their formation these days, we tend to think about uh, NATO and the American alliances in Asia uh, sort of dropping fully formed from the heavens um, as a sort of inevitable piece of beautifully designed architecture. Um, the reality, of course, is completely different. The reality is that at, at the time these alliances were formed, uh, America was just um, working its way out of the Second World War, uh, the, I think the, the largest and, and most appalling war in human history, and was going through one of its characteristic moments of reflection and um, contemplating what its future role in the world would be. And it was perfectly possible at that time that America uh, might have once again decided to pack up and go home. Um, but it didn't, of course. And these alliances uh, took shape. They took shape against the background of a debate in the United States about what the perimeter should be in Asia for defending America's security interests, what the, if you like, the geographic perimeter should be, and also what the normative perimeter should be. If America was going to lead uh, and play this role in the region, exactly what was it going to set out to defend? And of course, the Korean War, when it broke out, broke out over an ambiguity about what that, what that perimeter should be. And I think what's happening now in the Asia Pacific is that we're back at one of those sort of inflection points where the United States is again thinking very hard about what that perimeter should be, both in geographic strategic terms, but also in ideational and sort of um, thought leadership terms, if you like. So I want to talk about that today and the role of alliances in that. And just to, to finish off on the little sort of historical excursion, if you're interested in why, uh, why the alliances that, that Evan talked about in, in Asia are bilateral rather than a sort of multilateral NATO-style alliance, there's no better book in my view than my friend and colleague Victor Char's book called Power Play, which, which explains that America um, needed the sort of mass of multilateral deterrence in, in Europe uh, because it faced a, an ascendant Soviet Union. In Asia, the threat was different. Uh, there was concern about China, of course, but, and also about the Soviet Union, but the, perhaps the greater US concern was being dragged inadvertently into a future war by dodgy allies like, uh, like uh, Taiwan and the Philippines under some, some quirky leadership. So, so the US was worried very much about the risks of entrapment. But when, when the alliance system was ultimately designed uh, by John Foster Dulles, eventually the focus was on the first island chain, as it's called, that runs all the way up from, from the coast of Russia down through Japan and all the way uh, down the Western Pacific to Australia. And John Foster Dulles, in his mind, was clear that that was the centre of gravity for the United States, for its security interests in Asia. And it, to be very specific, he actually identified the Ryukus, the islands just to the south of Japan, as the absolute epicentre. And I think we're seeing some uh, historical continuities there. The alliances today are 
um, I think, being uh, stressed and strained in a way that we haven't seen for several decades. Some of these are external. Um, North Korea is the most obvious one. That'll be a huge priority during the President's visit. Uh, but I think it's important when we think about North Korea to think about North Korea's strategic intentions. And they're not just crazy, they have strategic intentions. One of those, their ultimate strategic intention is to reunify the Korean Peninsula on North Korean terms. But as a step to doing that, North Korea has sought for decades and continues to seek the ability to split America off from its allies, South Korea and Japan in particular. And its development of a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile capable of striking America is all about undermining those alliances. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Then, uh, and Evan mentioned the rise of China. China too is pursuing, I would argue, a long-term comprehensive strategy to reshape the region. I think the days when scholars argued seriously about whether China is a revisionist power are pretty much behind us. That's my sense in Washington anyway. And one of the things that China is trying to do is to undermine the alliance system, to erode them, to walk them back and ultimately to squeeze that source of American influence out of the Western Pacific. It's doing that using a whole range of, uh, of means. Sometimes it uses economic incentives, sometimes it uses economic coercion, it uses domestic political operations, it uses a whole range of other things like cyber, uh, its, um, its use of lawfare, um, and it uses its Coast Guard and other civilian enforcement agencies in this endeavour too, in a concerted way largely, I would argue. And then finally, it's military power. The military capabilities that China's developing are very much directed at blunting the ability of the United States to project power into the Western Pacific and to, and to implement its security commitments to its allies. And what China wants to do is to foment doubt on the part of those allies as to whether the United States can continue to project that military power into the Western Pacific. And whenever you're around the region, Evan spends a lot of time out there, I do too, the message that China and its diplomats are spreading is that the US is in decline, uh, that its power is waning, and that ultimately it can't be relied on as a dependable security partner in the future. And of course, at the same time, uh, we have uh, the Party Congress and President Xi outlining, I think, a much more um, assertive role for China, or at least um, making overt uh, an, an assertive role for China, and we can talk about this a bit, perhaps I, I would argue a slightly more ideological um, competition with the United States for influence in the region than we've seen thus far. And then on the internal side, many of these alliances are challenged too. Um, a lot of these countries are going through profound domestic, economic and social changes. Uh, trends like ageing are affecting their ability to, to invest in defence and other capabilities and roiling their politics, making it hard for them to settle on sensible, long-term, coherent policies. And there are vulnerabilities there being created around the region which China is exploiting with increasing deafness um, all around Asia. And then here, of course, in the United States, we've had the advent of the Trump administration. Uh, the, one of the things that's interesting about the president is that he's very sceptical about alliances. And he's actually got a public track record that goes back decades of being particularly critical of the US alliance with Japan and the alliance with South Korea. Um, even my own country, Australia, hasn't been spared from the sort of wire brush <laughs> of presidential disapproval. Uh, his, um, one of his early phone calls with Prime Minister Turnbull didn't go well, I think it's uh, fair to say. Um, but it's not just a Trump thing, this, this scepticism about alliances in the United States. Even President Obama was quite outspoken about what he saw as free-riding behaviour by America's allies. And I think there is something of a mood in the United States. I wouldn't call it isolationism myself, but there's more doubt about whether the the investment the United States has made for decades in maintaining this international order is, is really being paid off or not in terms of American interests. So what all of this raises really, I think, is the question of whether the alliance system itself in Asia is at 
uh, an inflection point. If you look around the region, there is evidence for that. Um, uh, and I think um, there's no better place to start with a quick tour than the Philippines, where you've got President Duterte, another rather interesting flamboyant leader. Um, you've also got a mix of Chinese, a uh, clever mix of Chinese incentives and coercion being deployed, and um, a real sense of doubt about whether, uh, as, as diplomats would say, whether China is starting to, sorry, whether the Philippines is starting to tilt uh, away from the United States and in the direction of China. In Thailand, of course, uh, following the coup, there's been a real cooling of US relations, uh, limitations on what the United States can do in terms of providing defence support and cooperation with Thailand, and basically that, that alliance is, um, is in the deep freeze. In South Korea, we have a new centre-left administration under President Moon, uh, and what that represent, represents, I think, is another swing in this pendulum that we see in the US-Korea uh, US alliance uh, between uh, the centre-right and the centre-left in South Korea, uh, where South Korean policy, or at least its rhetorical policy, goes through quite major swings. And, of course, added to that now, uh, acute anxieties in South Korea about the threat from the North, but also I think it has to be said about the possibility of US military action against North Korea and certainly uh, about the risk of that happening without proper South Korean consultation. Um, and I think, again, all of that points to a sense that South Korea could be in play, as it were, in this, in this broader competition between the United States and China for influence and for alignment. And then even in my own country, Australia, we've had, um, we've had a, quite a lively debate about whether Australia shouldn't be distancing itself somewhat from the United States and paying more attention to its economic interests in China. And um, there, I think the dynamic's pretty clear. President Trump's unpopular in Australia, as he is in many parts, for example, of Western Europe, and basically what that does is gives a, a free kick to opponents of the alliance and shuts down some of the space for the government and other supporters of the alliance to operate in. And those trends are reinforced, I think, on the, um, on the Chinese side by the impact of the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a vision, an integrated, uh, strategic, long-term vision for economic and broader engagement with a huge swath of the Eurasian continent, um, and, and the sharp contrast, contrast that represents with the collapse of the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade talks, uh, one of, I think, or perhaps even President Trump's first executive action after, after taking office. So there's a lot of reasons when you look around, if you adhere to a, a reasonably competitive view of the region, as I do, uh, I think for, for China to be feeling um, somewhat satisfied with the state of play, and the trends, and even perhaps, uh, and we were talking about this earlier, um, signs of a little bit of hubris in Beijing about quite how well things are going right now. Um, and I think you, you pick some of that up, not least in the Party con Congress, but also President Xi's um, very uh, high profile presence at the Davos meeting and the comments he made there about China sort of stepping up and taking on the mantle of free trade leadership globally. And it's true that all around the country you can see a degree of hedging. Countries are anxious about US commitment. They are swayed by China's rising power and they are starting to hedge uh, in, in, um, in a range of, of ways. So I think it's, it's fair to say that we can't really afford to be Pollyanna-ish about the alliances or about America's longer term position in Asia. And um, as a friend of the United States and a supporter of its role in the region, I think it's very clear that America can't, can't really afford too many more unforced errors like the TPP debacle. Because ultimately what I see is that China is mounting a sophisticated uh, full spectrum challenge to American power and influence in the region. If you're... Um, if you're rendered a bit gloomy by that, um, don't be. Uh, it's not the first time that uh, America's alliances have been through challenging periods. Just to mention a few, uh, an Australian Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, Daniel, um, 
well, he won't remember this, but he'll know about it, had a terrible relationship with President Nixon and the, relationship, the alliance between the two countries nearly blew up over the issue of Vietnam in the early 70s. Uh, President Carter famously tried to pull US troops, or announced he was pulling US troops out of South Korea in the mid-1970s and caused a crisis in that alliance. The troops are still there, fortunately. And then, of course, uh, Japan and the US had a series of disputes over trade and security issues pretty much all the way through the 80s and 90s. Um, and then the Philippines had difficult negotiations over the bases and ultimately they, they left. The no administration in South Korea, I mean, the list goes on. Um, alliance management uh, is not easy and um, if you're an alliance manager, life wasn't meant to be easy. That said, we can't be complacent. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is that China's rise is a challenge that the alliance, of, the, of the like the alliance system has not seen. Um, but, but at the same time, if you look structurally, so if you look below this surface noise and the tweets and the, and the sort of storm and drung of regional politics and media releases and so forth, I think there are some reasons to be um, rather more positive. For one thing, I think China's rise is generating um, a realist response from countries almost all around the region. Some of the smaller countries very close to China are certainly bandwag bandwagoning, pulling closer to China. But in other cases, there's, um, there's evidence, I think quite strong evidence, it's been building since the 90s that, that countries are looking actually to align themselves more closely and more strongly with the United States. Uh, the Japan alliance, for example, uh, has never been stronger. Now, a lot of people will say that's because of Prime Minister Abe and his leadership, and I agree with that. But if you look carefully again, I think that alliance has been significantly strengthening for a long time, certainly more than a decade. Abe's reforms are signif significant. Trump's personal rapport with Prime Minister Abe is an important factor as well. But the structural... Uh, underpinnings of that alliance are getting stronger, not weaker. And even if you look at the South Korean alliance, which often sounds a bit noisy and a bit sort of squeaky around the edges, I think it's stronger than it seems. So when I mentioned the no period, there were very difficult relation, relations between the Blue House in Seoul and the White House in Washington. But at the same time, over that period, most defence cooperation continued unabated and we often forget South Korea under the no administration sent 3,000 troops to Iraq. Um, so there was a lot going on there that points you in the direction I think of a closer alliance and despite China's massive pressure over the THAAD missile defence battery deployment, I think it's interesting that ultimately Seoul stared Beijing down over that, another sign I think that the fun fundamentals of the alliance are quite strong and again of course that's largely based on their threat perceptions. And then in the Philippines where um, President Duterte is sort of earthy and um, direct in his views about the United States and makes no secret of his, um, his affection for China, the reality is that 90 or 95 per cent of what America does with the Philippines militarily and in terms of security has gone on completely uninterrupted by any of that. And in fact, when, uh, when jihadis took hold of a, a town in um, the southern Philippines, Marawi, fairly recently, I think it, that brought home even more strongly to the Philippines' leadership that the United States still plays a vital role in security for the Philippines. And, of course, President Trump will be, will be going there, as I mentioned, on this visit. So that alliance, despite some, um, some challenges, I think fundamentally is not, uh, not beyond hope either. And here I'm going to turn and talk just a little bit, um, if you don't mind, in, in um, slightly more detail about my own country, Australia, because I think, in a way, it offers a bit of a case study of what's uh, going on out there among allies. Now, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with a whole lot of um, complex graphics. This, um, this, though, is quite interesting. This shows Australia's trading relationships for its entire time as a, as a nation. And unsurprisingly, that yellow line is Britain. <laughs> you can see what's happening there. 
The US, while it's been a critical um, strategic partner for Australia and a very important investment player, as you can see from this, is not a particularly important trade partner for Australia and never really has been. But what's fascinating, again, is to contrast the sort of decline in the yellow line with that sort of purple coloured line on the right, and that is, uh, that is our exports to China. And that, that tells you visually what is happening in terms of Australia and trade and our increasing uh, dependence on China, at least when it comes to trade. Now, a lot of that is, um, the vast bulk of that, I think about three quarters, is raw materials. Um, iron ore in particular, but, al but also coal and LNG. But another, compo sorry, another component of it uh, is this um, very marked increase in our service exports uh, to China, in, particularly, in particular students up the top there, um, growing, growing very rapidly and a really, really important market for, uh, for Australian universities, um, absolutely vital. And China's also playing a much greater role in terms of research funding in Australia. Um, and then also in the service sector, this is tourism. And again, look at the gradient on that chart. Um, these tell, I think, a pretty compelling story about why Australians are very conscious of uh, China's importance to us economically uh, and why that, why, that, um, why that matters quite as strongly as it does to Australia. The, the problem is that um, for a couple of decades, this was a straightforward thing to manage. Neither in the resources field or these other sectors of the economy does China pose the sort of economic challenge to Australia that it does to the US. China has not been hollowing out Australian manufacturing. I'll put that in, in inverted commas, if you like, depending on how much you believe it or not. Um, uh, it's a very different economic relationship uh, with, with far fewer downsides, frankly, for Australia. But it is becoming um, more complicated than that. Um, it, one of the reasons for that is uh, China's policies around foreign investment and the kind of going out strategy. Now, you can see, again, from this chart something important. That is, think back to the trade chart. Uh, China's massively important to Australia. Look at, look at how relatively unimportant China is in terms of investment. Uh, the United States is far and away our most economic partner, uh, most important economic partner if you factor in investment as well as trade. Uh, and our other traditional, if you like, European or Western investment partners are also incredibly important to Australia. What's changing though is the nature of that foreign investment is starting to touch on sensitivities in the Australian economy and in Australian society. And I think we're starting in Australia to see a debate uh, that, that goes beyond this sort of ideal that we've enjoyed for a couple of decades around us digging stuff up and selling it to China without that causing any problems for us socially or economically or in terms of our alliance with the United States to rather a more complicated um, picture. And one, man one manifestation of this is uh, a debate that's broken out in Australia really in the last six months about the extent of Chinese political influence inside Australia. These are some, um, some newspaper headlines that I've just pulled out to sort of give you a flavour for what that, what that debate looks like. This, um, this uh, image down here is from a one hour investigative documentary report that got huge new, uh, headlines all across Australia about the extent of Chinese political involvement, the role of Chinese uh, money coming into our political parties as donations. Americans are often surprised to hear that we do not have a ban in Australia on foreign donations. Uh, I think there's legislation being prepared that fixes that. But there is now, I think, this debate in Australia about influence and what that means and whether Australia uh, can have quite the simplistic um, approach to the relationship with China that we have had thus far. There are other dimensions of this challenge and how Australia is responding as well. Uh, Australia has been reinvesting quite seriously in its defence capabilities 
uh, for about the last decade. In particular, it's been beefing up its naval forces, its air forces. Uh, that's not, of course, all about China, but it is driven at least in part about concern about China's military modernisation and also about the knock-on effects of that because other countries all around Asia are um, um, also modernising their militaries and that's putting pressure on Australia's traditional capability edge in Southeast Asia and that's of concern to Australian defence planners. Australia's been reasonably forward-leaning in its public comments on the South China Sea and some of China's actions there and over about the same time frame, the last decade, just over a decade, Australia's also been increasing its, the strength of its alliance with the United States. So we have uh, marine forces rotating through northern Australia for about six months of the year and increasingly US, large US aircraft um, uh, rotating through northern Australia as well. And then finally, in terms of this, uh, this response that I see emerging in Australia to China's rise and its increasing influence and some of the the stresses that it's putting on the, the regional order and the global order, Australia's been stepping up its defence and other strategic engagement with a range of like-minded countries, most significantly Japan, where we've gone from having a very strong trade and diplomatic relationship all of a sudden within a decade to having a very substantial defence and security relationship. Australia is by far Japan's second most important strategic partner now behind the United States and we've been doing a lot trilaterally through the trilateral strategic dialogue to build that relationship. Uh, Australia also has a very close defence relationship with Singapore. This is also related, very large-scale training of the Singaporean military using Australia's large air and sea ranges, quite a strong uh, Singapore military presence in Australia. We're doing more with India also, stepping up naval exercises, especially in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and there's talk of the, the so-called quadrilateral dialogue, uh, which was terminated rather abruptly by uh, uh, the former Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, uh, but that coming back on the agenda. And I think, again, this is a sign of gathering interest uh, in Canberra, but also other allied capitals in engaging partners like India that can be helpful in meeting this longer-term challenge. And I think we'll see... Uh, progress towards stronger quadrilateral defence and security cooperation among those four countries as we go forward. Um, and I think what this points to is, um, as Evan said, not, uh, not an, an Asian NATO. I don't think we're heading for a multilateral security structure in Asia like the one that is present in Europe. But I do think we are heading seriously in the direction of a more multilateral, more networked alliance structure that hopes to shape the region in ways that are favourable to the United States and its genu generally maritime democratic allies, um, and also that have something of a deterrent sort of restraining effect in terms of, of China's behaviour. Uh, and that applies in, in the so-called grey zone conflict in particular, whether it's in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. And also, I think, those countries, the United, um, Australia, Japan, India, Singapore, are going to work harder uh, to counteract any suggestion of US disengagement or retrenchment from the region. So what does all this mean, um, perhaps coming full circle to where I started historically? I think it means that, again, we're back in a period uh, a bit like the very early 1950s. Dean Acheson, the US Secretary of State at the time, called his memoirs uh, present at the creation and perhaps we're all present at the recreation. I think we're, we're heading into a much more contested region than we've seen for several decades. I think the extent of that contestation is going to depend very largely on China's actions and the extent to, with, to which it's able to demonstrate restraint as it rises, and like Evan, I think it is going to continue to rise. Uh, I don't see any dramatic scenario where, where the Chinese economy suddenly implodes or anything like that, or, or the Communist Party falls from power. Um, but I think the US alliance system, as it becomes more multilateral and more capable, is well positioned to play 
this pivotal balancing role in maintaining a favourable balance of power, man helping to manage that competition and deterring adventurism if that comes onto the agenda. I think the vision laid out by Secretary Tillerson of a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, is, is an encouraging start. Um, one would like to see a trade policy inserted at Tab A um, and various other bits and pieces at Tabs B and C. Um, but, but the vision, I think, is one which uh, the US partners in Asia should be encouraged by. And I think one of the tests, certainly, that in my commentary about the President's visit to Asia, I've been pointing to is the extent to which his visit starts to flesh out that vision that Secretary Tillerson laid out a couple of weeks ago. Ultimately, though, this can't just be a military strategy. And at the moment, the United States in Asia is long on military and short on just about everything else. <laughs> and what we know, uh, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a plug for another friend and colleague's book, but, but Mike Green, uh, who's, who's at CSIS, of course, has written a book about the history of US grand strategy in Asia. And what, what he concludes, having studied several hundred years of American engagement in the region, is that it's only when US military power is firmly aligned with free and open economic policies and with strong American ideational leadership that American strategy tends to succeed in Asia. And your allies need it to succeed in Asia today. Thank you. Sounds like Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping's goals actually are very closely aligned. So is the idea of enlisting China to uh, roll back North Korean nuclear capability fanciful? Or conversely, would that make rolling back North Korea's nuclear capability extremely important as a sign both a uh, strengthened alliances and a strengthened partnership between the United States and China. Uh, so uh, the, the question really is, should that uh, question of rollback versus uh, tolerate be elevated as an issue, or is it, uh, should it be deep, uh, should it not be mentioned and, and quietly uh, uh, avoided? <laughs> it's a great question. If I was here as an official, I'd be saying, of course, we're committed to a peaceful solution in North Korea and to its complete irreversible, verifiable denuclearization. I think that's a complete fantasy. Uh, I, it, it's not going to happen. Um, and, and the idea that um, there's anything really to sit down and talk to this guy about is equally fanciful in my view. That doesn't mean I support a preventive military strike on North Korea. I don't. I don't think there's a credible option to do that. So what does it mean? Uh, I think it means that we're stuck in a very messy, open-ended situation of containing North Korea. And um, I think keeping pressure on China to be part of that containment is going to be absolutely critical. Um, that's going to have military components. It's going to involve a greater military presence. It's going to involve stronger missile defences. But I think the part of this that really worries me, that as best I can see, no one's talking about, is North Korea's appalling proliferation record. I mean, these people have no compunction about selling the worst technology in the world to, to anyone who'll buy it. Exhibit A being their provision of a nuclear reactor to Syria, which thankfully the Israelis mm -hmm. took care of a number of years ago. So I think we should be thinking about and talking about with China, and if they won't come along without China, um, you know, a much more forceful blockade type arrangement to stop proliferation by North Korea, you know, stopping and boarding their ships, etc. Um, and we're going to have to build stronger extended deterrence. My, my concern about North Korea having nuclear weapons is not so much that they'll use them against San Francisco. I don't think they can reach Chicago. Um, but, um, but much more that they will use the sort of umbrella provided by nuclear weapons to engage in a whole range of other provocations using their conventional forces and their covert forces against the South, for example, or against Japan, feeling secure because they have nukes that they won't, they won't risk a, um, a very weighty conventional response from the US and its allies. And I think 
um, our defence planners are going to have to pay a lot of attention to how we, we generate more, more of that sort of deterrence, as well as, of course, deterring them from using nuclear weapons, whether it's against um, the United States or Japan or South Korea. Uh, with regard to uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's recent snap election victory, and as well as his bent on revising the pacifist constitution of Japan, what does that signal in terms of strategic defense operations with the United States? I know President Trump openly encouraged Japan to acquire nuclear weapons during the campaign, um, and though maybe that was misguided rhetoric, it has since been toned down. Uh, would the United States be open to that possibility of a more strong-armed and Japan, or even a nuclearized state? I think, um, again, I'd kind of strip the tweets out of it. Um, I think if you step back, um, Japan's been on a path towards playing a more active and more substantial security role for a long time. I ran the uh, Japan desk in our foreign service in 2000 and 2001. And at that time, I remember this, in the academic community, at least in Australia, there was a serious debate about whether Japan was capable of strategic thought. That was kind of, that was where things were. That's a pretty low bar. Um, uh, thankfully, um, it, it's proven that they are capable of strategic thought. And I think what you can see going right back to that period is actually a very rational Japanese response to the security threats that it faces, um, constrained by its history, constrained by its constitution, and constrained very much by its domestic politics. So take Abe out of it for a moment. I think Japan would have been on that path. Uh, Abe, and in particular Abe's second term, where he's come back as this sort of reinvigorated, much more sophisticated, much more astute, much more successful politician, um, has accelerated that trend, I think. Uh, and I certainly welcome that. I, I think um, he's, uh, he's, he's doing his country a great service uh, and I personally think in the last six months or even a bit longer since the US election, he's actually done the region a service in the way he's kind of stepped up and assumed um, responsibility for engaging President Trump and the administration in quite the way he does. I mean, I think it's been a sort of bravura performance myself. Um, and not without risk for Abe. Um, so, so I think it's just important to sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm an agency guy. I think, I think that people matter and political leadership matters a lot. And um, Abe, I, I was actually worried for a day or two after he called the election that he'd kind of done a Theresa May. <laughs> um, but, but it turned out he didn't. It turned out, I think, you know, once again, he showed that he's just got this very sophisticated grip now on what he's doing. Um, and, and I, think, I think that's a good thing in a dangerous time like this to have that continuity and to have that sense of direction. And I personally don't buy into the sort of... I mean, I think Abe's, you know, clunky around history and I kind of cringe every time um, he or his, some of his cabinet ministers go there. But, but I don't at all buy the view that he's on about returning Japan to some sort of dark militarist path. I just... I, I, I think that's fanciful too. areas to cover, Seto, uh, Taiwan, and uh, the All Black. <laughs> we beat the All Blacks the other day for the first time in ages, so we've, done, we've dealt with that. Seto um, um, is interesting. Um, for those who don't know, it's the Southeast Asia Treaty Organisation. Um, I think it formally... I'm showing my ignorance here. It still formally exists, but it's basically... Um, it's basically dormant and it never really sort of um, developed in the way that I think its advocates hoped. I mean, myself, uh, I think it's interesting. There's another old piece of architecture in the region which I think does still have a future and that's the five power defence arrangements, which is actually, this sounds really weird, but it's Australia, uh, the UK, New Zealand plus Malaysia, plus Singapore. And under that arrangement, there's a thing called the Integrated Air Defence, which is actually um, kind of in, a, in an echo of 1942, is about Australia and the UK and New Zealand, although I don't think they have any planes, um, uh, providing air defence for the Malay Peninsula, so for, for Malaysia and Singapore. 
I think that that arrangement still exists. Australia still flies surveillance aircraft out of Butterworth in Malaysia. We still exercise that air integrated air defence, uh, and I think its time is going to come again uh, in the light of what I've outlined in terms of the region. And sorry, what was the last bit of your uh, Taiwan. Taiwan? Yeah, yeah, I didn't mention Taiwan. I should have. Um, I defer to Evan on this, but. Uh, I'm concerned about the likelihood of a more muscular approach from the mainland um, in the wake of the party congress. I think that was being kind of got out of the way. I'm not. I'm not saying that. Um, I'm not saying there's going to be an invasion imminently or anything like that. But I do think that that there's a growing sense in Beijing that time's really on its side. And I also, Evan and I have both been separately in Taiwan in the last few weeks, and there's a kind of you know, there's a sort of sense of ebbing, ebbing confidence, I'd say, there about the longer term. Um, the problem, of course, is that the, the domestic trend is actually that Taiwanese feel more and more their own sense of identity. And there's hardly anyone I can see that's really interested in being reincorporated, as it were. And um, if China, if, if China's... Um, Hong Kong takeover is a kind of you know model. Then it's not a very attractive one um, anymore either. So so look, I'm I'm I think I sense you know why you're asking the question, and I'm I'm pessimistic about it too. And I think um, it's going to require a lot of kind of restraint, and um, we're all going to have to work hard at kind of keeping a lid on it. But I I, I don't think the, the the sort of longer term trend is terribly good. Uh, you mentioned how Australia is investing more in its navy because of not just because of China, but because of broader militarisation in the region. I was just wondering, to what extent is that going on? Um, is anyone in the region sort of keeping up with China, so to speak? And to what extent is it sort of destabilising or potentially destabilising? Um, it is. De I wasn't going to show this, but I will. <laughs> it's destabilising because of that. Is anyone keeping up? Um, sorry, I'm being glib. It, it's destabilising because the ramping up of that big red bit at the top um, may not amount to a peer qualitative challenge to the United States Navy when you accumulate not just um, pack fleet but also uh, the US Navy based on the west coast of the United States and some of the US Navy assets in the Indian Ocean at the western end of the Indian Ocean. But numerically, this is a huge problem and a huge challenge, um, and in particular, submarine numbers are a huge problem and a huge challenge, because eventually, um, it, 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 it is a game of numbers. Eventually, quantity has a, qu a quality all of its own, and, and so this is changing the balance of power, certainly in the Western Pacific. Uh, and over time, as China puts more emphasis on power projection, particularly into the Indian Ocean, it's going to change things there as well. Um, and I think a lot of the allied responses I talked about are geared to responding to this and recognising that there's, there's a centrifugal force that's pulling those allies together just to balance this and to have some chance of kind of keeping tabs on, on that. Um, is anyone sort of going with China or keeping up? Um, the one I would point to is Japan. Uh, I mean, in, in the East China Sea, where, of course, China has... Um, claims over the Senkaku's diaries. Um, um, basically, China's deterred by Japan. I, th I think the calculation in Beijing at the moment is that, especially while Abe is there, but probably beyond Abe, that um, the balance of military power in the East China Sea is not favourable to China. But that's not stopping... China putting a whole lot of pressure on the Japanese presence using the, the maritime militia, the Coast Guard, you know, naval penetrations of the, of the islands and all that sort of stuff. So, so I would describe that as very aggressive probing and, and they'll keep probing until they don't meet resistance one day, if that happens. Uh, but, but basically at the moment, and I would say for the next sort of, you know, five-ish years maybe 10 years, um, I think China's effectively deterred in the East China Sea. Um, they're not at all deterred in the South China Sea. I mean, they're, 
the Vietnamese um, have a history of giving China a bloody nose and um, uh, still have some very capable forces and obviously they're looking to do more with the US and Japan in particular, India, also Australia, to sort of strengthen their position. But they're just, you know, they're, or well, you can see them down there in the blue. I think that's them. Um, not really in the same game, not the same league. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that much of China's um, economic or much of China's current influence comes from um, economic alliances or economic incentives with smaller uh, Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. and, but it seems to be relatively unsuccessful in making stable alliances with, I guess, countries that are more internationally influential like Japan. So what do you think this could mean for China's rise in the long run? It's a really important question because, um, you know, against this backdrop, this, this chart tries to capture kind of military as well as Belt and Road and so forth, but, but influence basically of different types. Um, I think it tells you that, um, that China has a you know, very concrete plan for engaging a lot of those sort of small mid-sized com um, countries. I think that that experience is not always going to be terribly successful for the country in question or for China in particular because I think as a matter of deliberate policy um, China's extending loans to a lot of these countries rather than giving them grant aid and that means there's going to be dependence and um, Australia used to have colonies um, dependence breeds resentment so I think that's going to be problematic and also the model where very often China uh, has a, as a requirement that the labour force to build the investment uh, infrastructure projects and so on is Chinese imported labour force is difficult for smaller countries. So I think, um, I think you're right. I think some of those countries will have a good experience, some won't, but I don't think it's going to be uniform, the same everywhere. Uh, and then what I see is um, countries like Japan and increasingly India are also starting to sort of compete with China in that infrastructure game. Uh, they're using their own uh, export finance bank, uh, JBIC, and um, other instruments of policy to, if you like, push back a little or to provide an alternative to, to the Chinese model in this area. Um, the, the complete absentee, unfortunately, is the United States, which, tell me I'm wrong, Evan, please, but um, just not playing in that. Um, but I think the interesting part of your question is Japan I do see stepping up and being more strategic um, I see a role for Australia, perhaps a more marginal role. Um, uh, but I do think that you'll see this, um, and I think this is partly what Tillerson's Free and Open Indo-Pacific's about. I mean, I, I was very struck when he called out China for predatory economic behaviour in that, in that speech. The problem is that's just a kind of, <laughs> it's a one-line observation. It's not a trade and economic policy for the Indo-Pacific. Um, and that's, that's where I'd be critical of the administration because you can't beat something with nothing. Uh, apart from perhaps multilateral, bilateral relationship, diplomatic relationship between Asia-Pacific countries, how do you see the role of international organizations in the area in terms of handling uh, conflicts and just abroad events? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I didn't mention the institutions, did I? Um, so I've been to a number of East Asia summits and a number of APEC leaders meetings. Uh, and if you've, if you've been in the room for those meetings, it's hard to be wildly excited about them. <laughs> Evan has to. <laughs> um, but look, regional architecture, to use that term, is an important part of this picture. And I think we see a degree of... The, the way I think about this is that certainly relative to Europe, uh, the institutions in the Indo-Pacific are, are um, immature, um, underdeveloped, um, and as yet not very effective for doing what you're talking about. Um, that doesn't mean that over time they can't be, and it doesn't mean they're unimportant. So I think they're important because uh, countries turn up, or they should turn up, um, uh, and, and that that forces a degree of kind of socialisation, it forces... Um, people at least to kind of play nice um, 
and it, it, it can over time create habits of sort of the right sorts of habits. And also it can be a place where countries, if they're not sort of meeting expectations of the other members, can, you know, in one way or another be brought to account. Now, we've seen quite clearly that the, the ASEAN based institutions are not able to do that and we've seen that Beijing's good at sort of picking one ASEAN off and then weakening the, the ASEAN consensus as it were. But frankly, even the fact that all of that's happening, I would assume is somewhat embarrassing for Beijing. It's not a terribly good look if, you know, that all the, all the media reports out of a big meeting are that China's been nobbling people to use an Australian term. Um, so I, I, think, I think the the regional institutions are not unimportant, um, but I do think that they're not sufficiently robust yet to be sort of load-bearing, um, uh, to, to use that architectural language, um, and that at the moment they are much more forums within which competition is playing out than, than forums which are actively helping to manage that, that competition. And, and, you know, that's disappointing, but it's not totally surprising to me as a realist. Regarding institutional building and particularly in the, in the ambit of uh, trade relationships, um, how do you see China's uh, position with regards to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and vis-a-vis -vis the United States withdrawal from the TPP? I mean, the TPP things, you know, it's, it's sort of mind-boggling. It's, it's so frustrating that even if you believe everything that President Trump says about China's trade practices and so forth, the one instrument that's tailor-made for dealing with that is the one that he sort of took out and blew up on his first day in the White in the Oval Office. It's, you know, it's beyond disbelief, really. Um, RCEP, um, I, I, I'm not in the camp that says that China's kind of just inexorably moving into the vacuum. I mean, I think. I think China's quite good at creating the impression it is. Um, you know, a lot of people when the president of China went to Davos and said, you know, I'm the champion of free trade, a lot of people went, oh, gosh, yes, I suppose you probably are. And, you know, a lot of the rest of us are going, you've got to be kidding. Um, so so that, at that sort of perception level, I think it's important. Um, but RCEP, at the end of the day, again, we were talking about this over a sandwich, RCEP has India in it. Um, Bless. That means nothing's going to happen, and if it does, it's going to happen very slowly. And um, it's it's not actually a Chinese creation. RCEP is an ASEAN process, an ASEAN mechanism, with all of the kind of everything that comes along with that, good and bad. So I don't I don't actually see, um, and and I think Belt and Road, you know, it's kind of catchy and it's high profile, and everyone's very very excited. I'm a little in the camp. I, I don't doubt it's, it's significant and it's, it's very strategic and, you know, this, as a, I'm a strategist, I get it, you know, tick. But there is going to be uneven implementation of this. There's going to be pushback. There's gonna, there are question marks about whether a lot of that investment's ever going to actually, you know, hit the ground. Sure, some of it will. There'll be, but it's going to be spotty and kind of patchy and I don't know what this looks like in 10 years. I mean, maybe it all happens. Maybe it... You know, bits fall off, but um, but I don't think that I think if you're looking at RCEP as a kind of vehicle for China to reshape the regional economic order, you're looking in in the wrong place. I think paying more attention to this and starting to rebuild um, a commitment to free, open economic institutions in the region is is absolutely critical, and I think that's why. Japan and Australia together, and I don't think that's a coincidence, are leading the charge on TPP-11. Uh, I also think that you'll see the Trump administration cut and paste the TPP rules into a series of bilaterals with all the TPP members. Is that as good as TPP? Obviously not. It's better than nothing, though. Um, so I think, I think there'll be this sort of muddled coexistence of China's vision, fitful US economic statecraft in the region and because I'm an optimistic kind of guy, you know, a return to something resembling American economic leadership in, in the Indo-Pacific. I, I certainly hope that and that's what your allies desperately want, as much as we want your know, aircraft carriers and everything else.
Okay.